Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. My name is Wayne Risher. I'm the Family Life Pastor here at FaithBridge. And today, if you're dialing in for the first time, let me just tell you that two things happen here at Postscript. First of all, your questions get answered. And secondly, it gives our teaching team an opportunity to give us a little something extra after the message today. And joining me today is Duffy Robbins, who just finished a great message on the text from Acts 27. So welcome. Glad to have you. Thanks, Wayne. Good to be here, yeah. my friend. So we have a couple of questions that we want to just process after your message today. Right. Uh, the first one is based on one of the points you mentioned. Um, you talked a little bit about today of finding God's will in the midst of the storm. And I suppose that our response, which was one of your points, has a little to do with awareness. And so if it has something to do with awareness, how do we become more aware of God's will in the midst of the storm and uh, the circumstances going on around us? How do we press in to find out what we're looking for there? Yeah, um, that's a great question because part of what I was talking about is that sometimes God, you know, just uses the storms that are caused by our own bad decisions. We sort of mm -hmm. sail into the consequences of our own bad choices. Other times, um, you know, God uses a storm that, that, you know, it's not necessarily because we did anything wrong, but he uses that storm in a way that, that uh, you know, helps him to accomplish his purposes in us. And, and then um, I think it's true, although it's probably a part about God that, that we, we don't like to talk about it. But there are some times when God does punish us and he brings storms hmm. into our lives. That's and good. clearly you see that um, in, in Scripture. So, so uh, storms come their ways. And, I, and part of the question, well, how do I know and, and how do I respond? Uh, and I think... That part of the idea, and C.S. Lewis refers to this, is that part of the idea behind a storm is that if nothing else, it slows us down. I mean, it 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 interrupts our our course. It interrupts our journey enough so that sometimes you have to go, wait, wait a minute, you know, what, what's going on in here? I mean, uh, as a male, of course, I am omnicompetent when I'm driving, <laughs> and any uh, instruction about uh, checking a map or you know GPS, I mean, that's uh, useless. And and uh, but there's one thing that uh, will kind of make me stop and pull over because otherwise I'm just I'm headed. Yeah. One thing will stop is I go. You know what? I don't. I don't this is not where I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm somehow off track here, and 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 storms sometimes force us to pull over, or to or to to stop, or in in the case of Acts 27 to get literally knocked off of the beach and uh, you know knocked on the beach, and in Jonah's case. You know, you wind up, you're in hot pursuit of your own plan, and you end up in the belly of a great fish. So, right. so I think that's the first thing, is that storms kind of make us alert. And so part of what I want to do in my own life is try to develop uh, that sense of alertness. Um, Wesley called it uh, a sensitivity to sin. Mm. It's sort of like uh, one a Puritan writer by the name of John Flavel said, it's like when you get something in your eye, and, you know, you don't, you immediately begin to blink and try to flush it out. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if I caused it or you know, but it's here, and 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 it's a, it's not that I am perfect, but I am trying to be sensitive to God's movement in my life, and I want to try to respond. Uh, you know, whether it's a storm, whether it's a grain of sand in my eye, or or whatever. I really want to. I really want to be attentive to that. So part of it is an attentiveness. Um, different Christians down through the centuries have practiced this attentiveness different ways. Uh, Leighton Ford, for example, uh, an evangelist of the Billy Graham Association, uh, wrote a book called The Attentive Life, in which he talks about practicing um, what's, uh, what are the uh, calls to prayer throughout the day that uh, monastics would mm -hmm. often do. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a way of saying, look, pull over, you know, Pull over several times a day, if, even if it's just for a minute, literally, mentally pull over in your heart and say, God, what's going on here? What am I excited about? What am I, what am I, what, what feels, is there a kind of a sort of a something in my spirit that's not right? And so, and so it's, it's the first thing I think is in paying attention, but that's also one of the reasons why it's great to have a fellowship, like a small group we have, you know, right. here at Faith Bridge, because, because sometimes, um, 
I don't see stuff. Uh, in, in driving, for example, is quite often my wife who will first ask, do you think <laughs> this is the right road? <laughs> I don't want to ask that question because I think it might not be. Yeah. So having people in my life, uh, a, a band of brothers or sisters, somebody's gonna walk with us, um, it's a different kind of attention. It's someone else paying attention uh, to my life. Um, so I would say those those are, are two ways of uh, of doing it. You know, um, I think it was Ignatius who talked about the examen that every night when he goes to when he would go to bed. Uh, you know, this is again part of monastic tradition. He would think back about his day. What was the consolation and what was the desolation mm, of my day? So in good. essence, what was the storm? That's the yep. desolation. And what was the consolation? Where did I sense uh, God's God's you know goodness or God's blessing in a good way, um, and so that's that's another way you, that, that you could just do that at night, laying in bed before you drift off to sleep, just do something along those mm -hmm. lines. But essentially, it's it's trying to be attentive, trying to pay attention. Jonah was trying to ignore God; he felt it. <laughs> right. Paul was in the going. You know what? I still see God. I, I'm still seeing God in the middle of the storm. Mm -hmm. That's good. So pulling over. Being in community, and the third one you mentioned. Well, the, the, that that the daily the, debrief. Sort yeah, of sort of a, a daily debrief, yeah. right? Where you just you, you might at night to say, what am I? What's my consolation and what's my desolation? That's a good rhythm. So yeah. yeah, that's a good way to help us drive into our awareness in the middle of the storm. A second question I had um, was: some of us have shipwrecks in the past. Yeah. So specifically, <laughs> we may feel guilty for the way we didn't trust or respond rightly to God. And, yeah. and worse, uh, are those of us who are dealing with our own storms made by our own hand, our own mm -hmm. shipwreck. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you mentioned at the very end of your talk a little bit about um, uh, guilt and not letting that be the lens with which we filter. Can you bring that a little clearer for us and, and expand mm -hmm. that so we can find out how guilt might keep us from right. finding the will of God, yeah. Right, yeah, well, um, again, um, in, the, in the sermon today, I talked about this, I read this Dear Abby letter, and that this guy got, you know, tattooed <laughs> on his behind, and, uh, and so uh, he feels really guilty about having that, he's going to this church camp with all these yeah. kids, and I guess he's a leader or something, and, um, and I sort of made the point that everything he hears that week is going to, is going to be heard through the lens of his guilt. Mm, and what I mean okay. by that is like, is is if I think God is ticked off at me, you know, he's really upset with me for getting this tattoo and, and I don't know what kind of uh, shenanigans led to the tattoo. Maybe that's another podcast. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. he's feeling really terrible. Well, then you're not likely to go to God for consolation when you think your pain yeah. and storm is caused by that very God, mm. you know? So, so uh, that's, that's what I mean by don't let the lens muck up and distort mm. your view because guilt will do that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you don't do it by trying to kind of explain your guilt away or by doing kind of a, you know, kind of a uh, Oprahism where you go, oh, well, you know, you're just being true to who you are or whatever, you know? You go, no, you know what? That was a mistake. Yeah. But, God is not God is not stunned that I have sinned. That's why I sent His Son Jesus. Um, this is a part of what it means to be a, a person who lives with a sinful nature, and so uh, this is not this is not God. You know, ringing His hand, going, "Now what?" Um, he has made provision for us through His to the blood of His Son. So, so that's what I mean is sort of recognizing that perspective. Mm. Um, C.S. Lewis kind of talked about it as, you know, as sort of remembering too that, that I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but sort of like we think of time as, you know, being this linear thing where this is something that happens a hundred years from now and Jesus' death is something that happened right. 2,000 years ago. Okay. But, you know, C.S. Lewis reminds us that God is above all that. He's above time. He's eternal. So God sort of sees the entire table at once. We see the table from here, you know, looking that way, or maybe we're here looking back and looking at. And so whenever I sin, um, the great news of the gospel is that in that moment, in that eternal moment, God is seeing Jesus mm -hmm. die on my behalf. Mm -hmm. God is hearing his son Jesus plead on my behalf. 
And um, so it's not like when, when you send guys to go, oh, yeah, that's right. I remember that thing a long time ago where I died for Wayne. And, you know, it's it all happening in the same in the same moment. That's also why I think our sin is so offensive to God, to okay. his ra it incurs his wrath because, you know, how how rude to the 10th power that we would sort of be stomping on the crucifixion mm -hmm. when Jesus is dying here. God sees that. He sees it at the same moment he sees us sinning. Mm -hmm. And it just makes the offense that much, uh, you know, greater, I think. So, so it's, it's the knowledge that, uh, that, that the God that I have offended is the very same God who has extended to me his grace and oh, a way good. to, to uh, deal with the offense. Right. That's a hearkening right back to Genesis because that's exactly what Adam did. Guilt was his filter, and he hid. That's right, exactly. Hid. And and it, that's still living within all of us. Yeah, we've been uh, hiding from the beginning. Yeah, we've been hiding, and God <laughs> has been pursuing. And and of course, Luke fifteen, the story of the prodigal son, is a perfect, mm -hmm. uh, is a great example of that. A perfect example too of a guy who caused his own storms. R right. That's you know, but you know, even there, the father allowed the son to do that, in a sense, allowed him. I don't think the father said, oh, this is perfect. He's going to take his money. He's going to make some sound investments. He's going to no, <laughs> kid is going to mess it up. Yep. But he wasn't really his son until, I mean, he wasn't all of that meant. He was, you know, in he lived there, but the, the father wanted the son to live in relationship and mm -hmm. to love him and to feel the, the, the benefit of living in the father's house. So I go, okay, all right, you want to know what it's like? Uh, being out of the father, here's some money, go for it, kid. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that's what that's what happens sometimes when God allows us to face the consequences of our own self-imposed storms. Yeah, that prodigal son story is a great connective example. Yeah, uh, illustration yeah, right. to that. Good. Well, I'll wrap up the last two questions, sort okay. of combined into one. Okay. And th that is, you quoted Paul at the very end by saying, uh, take heart, have faith in God. And yet I'm wondering how we actually do that, a practical step for that. So if I'm right here in this moment, how might I write a note to myself and say, next time the storm comes, this is how my response ought to be. Mm -hmm. uh, comment on that for us. Um, I'll say, I, I'll make just two quick comments. One is, do the next thing. Do the next thing. Uh, what I mean by that is that, is that don't let, don't allow uh, fear of the storm or the turmoil of the storm uh, to blow you off course. If you hmm. feel you are on the course of what, you know, like I said, you talk to your friends, you talk, to, you, you, you listen, you're attentive, you say, God, is there something I need to hear? But if you go, no, this, storms happen. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they happen to, you know, they happen to all of us. And, and people who are, I mean, Jesus was killed. So, you know, these things happen to good people. Right. So, so the first thing is I say, okay, do not let this storm uh, or do not let this shipwreck in my journey. I'm gonna, I know God is going to carry me through. And it may be my next step. I mean, even Paul in this passage, Acts 27, it's interesting. He said, guys, I know it feels like we're going to die, but you need to eat. You're going to need your strength. Mm -hmm. And then he actually told the captain, some of the guys wanted to get off the boat uh, because they were trying to just escape. And he said, no, you're going to need all these guys. So he, you know, Paul said, no, you know what? It, in a sense, he was rationally taking the next steps that need to be take, okay. taken. Right. So I think that's, that's an important part of it. In my own life, when I've you know, faced trials and stuff, uh, I try to remind myself, okay, don't let that big dog scare you off of the trail. Mm, you know, that's good. Just keep walking yep. one step at a time. Yep. And sometimes in a storm, that's that's all you can do. Mm -hmm. Just do the next thing. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Elliot Leach, you know, talks about this when, you know, her husband Jim Elliot died taking the gospel to the Alka Indians in Ecuador. And uh, and that's one of the comments that she made is that in a time like that of just huge grief, he died with four other guys, missionaries, uh, that one of the things she really learned is that you just have to do the next thing. So yeah, if it's a loss thing. of a loved one, yeah, if it's, good. you know, financial, look, do the next thing. But the other thing is do the next thing, but don't uh, do anything drastic. In other words, uh, 
it would have been very easy for Paul to say, oh my gosh, the boat is going, we're going to jump off out here in the middle of the right. ocean. No, 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 no. It's bad, but stay on the, don't, don't make drastic big decisions mm -hmm. um, that you don't have to make. Uh, in the middle of a storm, because quite often those decisions are not good decisions. Yep. So, you know, do the next thing, but don't do anything drastic that you don't have to do because we're not in a, in a good place to make those choices. That's very helpful. Good word today. Thanks, man. You're always Appreciate one of Faith Bridge favorite rotation in our teaching team, so glad to have you. My pleasure. Thanks. And glad to have you at Postscript. Hope you'll join us next week as Duffy returns again. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.